so last time we started talking about uh, cables, um, we're going to get into a couple other ways that uh, objects can apply forces to each other. And so, I'm going to call this contact forces a first look. Um, a big topic in this class is going to be uh, understanding how to treat the contacts between different objects. Um, and these contacts between objects uh, are called joints, generally. Normally, if two things are just bumped against each other, you don't call it a joint. But that's what a joint is. It just determines how two objects are capable of applying loads to each other. Um, A joint is a connection between bodies. Um, some examples are, this is called a pin joint. Uh, it's sort of like a hinge. You can think of it as a hinge. Uh, this bar is free to swing this way or that way, but it can't. Its end can't move away from that point. Um, this is called a fixed joint. And if you have an object that's so it's a fixed joint because this can't move at all. It's like glued or welded or uh, built in there somehow. And if you have a beam that extends out from a joint like this with no other connections on it, that's called a cantilever. Um. And another type of joint. I don't know why I drew it that shape, but the shape doesn't matter. Is um, we did a problem with something like this. That's a pin in a slot joint. Um, there's a pin going through this body that's free to slide along here, so this thing can rotate freely and it can slide freely along this. But if you try to pull it that way. Uh, that slot will keep it from moving. So those are all different types of joints that in this class we're going to learn how to treat uh, to figure out what loads one body is applying to another one. Um, for now, we're just going to deal with three. Just three joints. Um, the first one is cables. And we've already done that one. Uh, the second one is uh, frictionless contact between two bodies. I'll, actually, I'll call it a pushing contact between bodies. And then the last one is a friction contact between two bodies. Uh, we've already done a bunch of examples of how to deal with cables. Uh, why don't you? up here above pushing. So just to make the distinction between two and three, let's call this frictionless pushing contact. OK, so the first thing is 
frictionless pushing contact um, and so if two bodies push against each other without friction um, then first uh, the force vector That contact force vector is perpendicular to the surface of contact. And, well, um, say that. This is a surface of contact, this underlying. Okay. Um, when we deal with force vectors, uh, they have to have a direction, right? So we know that um, if this was applying a force to another object, uh, the force that it applied would be perpendicular to that line. That's what that first thing says. But perpendicular to a line or perpendicular to a vector, uh, that's not enough information to know the direction. Right? Because perpendicular to this line, there's two possibilities. It could be this way or this way. So we need one more bit of information to pin down is it going this way or that way. And that's the second one. Um, it's toward the chosen body, away from the contacting body. Okay, so let me show some examples with free body diagrams. Um, so let's say that we have an incline. And on the incline, there are two carts. Uh, this one's five kilograms. And it's in contact with one that's three kilograms. And let's say there's a hundred Newton force pushing on the three kilogram cart. So what do these free body diagrams look like? We're going to do each one separately. Um, so first, a free body diagram of the five kilogram cart. And um, as I'm doing these free body diagrams, I want you to notice one thing. I think I mentioned this like the first day of class. But when you draw your free body diagrams, uh, here are the things that you that I should be able to tell from your free body diagram, direction, like related to direction. I should be able to tell when any two lines are parallel, when any two lines are perpendicular, and when two lines are neither of those, okay? So uh, you can see that this is a rectangular shape. You can see that it's at an angle. It's not horizontal or vertical. And as I draw these force vectors in, uh, you'll be able to tell which ones are perpendicular, parallel, etc. Okay, so what forces are acting on this? Uh, first, there's the weight. So 5 kilograms times 9.81, I'll just write that as 49.05. You could write that as mg, too. Um, 
And now we're just going around the boundary looking for places where the boundary makes contact with the surroundings. Uh, so I'll start over here. Nothing, 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 nothing. Then there's contact at the wheel. Okay. Um, I'm going to lump the two wheels into a single point, but if you wanted, you could deal with a force on this wheel and a force on this wheel. And so, um, what's happening at the ground? Is the ground pulling down on the wheel, spitting at the wheel, uh, pushing on it? Yes, pushing on it. So, uh, it's a frictionless pushing contact. That means that it's a force vector toward the body that we're isolating, toward the five kilogram, away from the contacting body, and it's perpendicular to that surface of contact. So, and you can call that whatever you want. It's just a variable name. I'm going to call it N for normal, but normal force is just a pushing contact force. And now we've dealt with the wheels. Now keep going around. And we get to here, and there's another pushing contact. The three kilogram cart is pushing on the five kilogram cart. And so there's another force that's perpendicular to the surface of contact, and it's toward the chosen body. So I'll call that R. Um, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if you went over this before, but mm -hmm. um, I guess how I had always done my diagrams in the past when we were working with like the center of the axis of the R would be how far the car would start. So I mean, do you find it good that way or do you always use the point of contact? Um, I don't care about that now. That's perfectly fine, but we are going to, um, like, very soon, we're going to. Stop dealing with particles, which is mostly what you did in physics. You dealt with particles until right at the end. Um, but when you stop dealing with particles and you start dealing with rigid bodies, the location of those forces starts to matter. You know, when it's particles, um, everything's happening at the same point, so you draw them wherever. But if you're treating this as a rigid body, the fact that this is acting here and this is acting here affects the motion. You know, so uh, some I don't care whether you know some people like to draw the tail of the vector at the location of the force or the head of the vector. And I don't care about that, but you are going to somehow have to indicate the location. Okay. Any questions about the free body diagram for the five kilogram? And now let's do the free body diagram for the three kilogram. So again, you can tell that's not horizontal. Uh, there's a weight force of 3 times 9.81. So that's 29.43. Um, there's a pushing contact from the ground. So I'll call that N. Let's call this one N3 and call this one N5. And then there's a pushing contact on the three by the five that's perpendicular to the surface of contact toward the chosen body. Um, and Newton's third law says if you switch, if you're dealing with one contact force and you switch to isolating the other body, the magnitude's the same, the direction changes. So I'm going to call that R. Any questions about that? Yes. Okay, so if you want to shift it, um, that's okay. Uh, but just make sure then that this doesn't look like it's straight down. You know? yeah. So then if you draw it, switch, R will look horizontal, N will look vertical, and this will look like it's off to the side. Okay, so that's a frictionless uh, pushing contact. So now, uh, what if you have a contact with friction? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yep. 
of the test. Thank you. All right, so now we're talking about um, friction contacts. So contacts between bodies where there's friction. This is the third one on my list. Um, so when there's friction between two bodies, uh, then the contact force between them is an unknown, a fully unknown force vector. So the contact force is an unknown force vector. You don't know either component. Um, when you dealt with friction in physics one, uh, you did it as a normal force and a um, and a coefficient times the normal force, right? So why don't we do that here in this class? It has to do with the difference between static and kinetic friction. If you remember, um, so with kinetic friction, you always know that the friction force is has the magnitude mu times normal, right? But with fret static friction, you don't know that the magnitude is mu times normal. You just know that the maximum friction force that it can apply is mu times normal, right? Remember that? So, um, so what that means is you can only use that expression mu times n if you happen to know that the object is right at the, at the edge of the, what friction force can apply right before it starts to move. Okay, and so in physics, when you did static friction problems, it was always like, what's the, it would ask you questions like that. What, what's the, what's the angle of this thing, uh, the maximum angle you can have before it starts to move. And so you're right on the edge. In this class, in statics, all, like, we're not going to ask questions like that. All we know is that the friction is enough for the thing to stay static. Okay, and so... We know it's less than mu times normal somewhere, but we don't know how much. And so we just have to treat it as a totally unknown magnitude force. Okay. Any questions about that? So we're not ever going to use, well, at the end we're going to for something sort of different. But for now, we're not ever going to use that mu times normal thing. We're just going to use a fully unknown force vector. Um, so... Here is an example. Um, so let's say we have um, an incline again and two boxes stacked on top of each other. Uh, this one's two kilograms and this one's one kilogram. And let's say there's a horizontal force of five newtons on that one and a force parallel to the surface on the bottom one, the magnitude of 10 newtons. And let's say there's friction at both contacts. Okay, well, let's... Start with a free body diagram of the um, one kilogram. So there's the body. The weight is one times 9.81. So 9.81. There's a five Newton force horizontal. And then at the ground, since there's friction between the one and the two, there's a fully unknown force vector, 
like that. Um, and I'll just call that the force vector f. Bless you. Yep. Do you care how we orient? OK, yes. So that, that's the next thing I wanted to say. So when you did this in physics one, anytime you had objects on inclines or whatever, you would orient your coordinate system so that the y-axis was going out of the surface. Uh, with friction problems in this class, there's no benefit to doing that. Um, the benefits for doing that were the following. It made the normal force simple to represent. It made the friction force simple to represent, and it made the acceleration simple to represent. Now we don't have any acceleration because it's statics. Uh, and we don't have to, we're not going to break it up into a normal force and a friction force. Because, I mean, this is still a normal force and a friction force. It just isn't broken up into, into those pieces. It's broken up into two different pieces. But that vector still represents those same things. Okay, so there's... Um, the reason that we don't need to represent this as a normal force times a friction force is that our friction in physics one, you knew the friction force. If you knew the normal, you could calculate the friction force. In this case, we don't, we're not dealing with that coefficient. So there's no point in taking the time to re-represent this. All that would do is make it complicated to represent the weight force. So we're not going to do things with, uh, if, if you have things sliding on a surface, whatever, there's no benefit to rotating the coordinate system. Any other questions about that? Okay. Uh, this is a free body diagram of the one. And now the free body diagram of the two kilogram. Yes. Um, for the friction force, do you want both of the axes, or do you did you just do that to make it easier to find the normal? Um, this force here. So whenever you know that there's a friction force in this class, uh, all you do is whatever coordinate system you're using, you just represent it as an unknown force vector. You're going to have to calculate both of those two. So I drew it like this to say we have an unknown x and an unknown y, and they add up to be this vector f. All right, so now the two kilogram, uh, there's a weight force of 2 times 9.81. There's a 10 newton applied force. There's <clears throat> oh, yes. It's fine. I, I mean, I guess I tend to leave them off because you know that anything up there is a force. So whatever units you're using, you know, you know it as units of force. But there's no reason not to put them on there. Any other questions? All right. So now at the ground, there's a friction contact. And so I'll call that, um, I don't know, I'll call it the vector r. And then up here, there's an unknown force vector. And what do we know about that force vector? Uh, yeah, same, uh, equal and opposite. So we could write this as the force vector f1 or something. Newton's third law says since this is the force on one by two, and this is the force on two by one, we might as well write that as negative f. Um any questions about that? Yes. So you would like us to for the unknown vector is that intersection point in the x and the y axis. That's where. We that's how I do it. Um, there's a few ways that people do it. Um, 
people will also do this pretty often um, where you have so you have a vertical force and a horizontal force and you name this one fx and you name this one fy that's right so yeah you're you want some in some way you want you need to show the point where that force applies and i do it at where those two vectors meet Uh, did you have a question too? For uh, for now, you can yes. For now, these are all particles, so really, even the fact that it's along that line doesn't matter. We're just treating everything like it's at the same location. Um. All right, so now before we can do problems, um, I want to talk about a naming convention. So I'll call this the subscript notation. For naming contact forces. So if you have a force vector F sub AB, that means the force vector acting on A by B, where A and B are two different bodies. So, for example, um, if you had two boxes like this on the floor, um, let's say this one's 20 kilograms and this one's 30 kilograms. Uh, and let's say you have a 50 newton force there then a free body diagram of the 20 kilogram box would look like this you have the weight force uh 196.2 you have the 50 newton force and then you have a contact force applied by the 30, and that's a friction contact force. So I'll write it like this. Um, and we'll call that the force on the 20 by the 30. Or if you named them bodies A and B or bodies 1 and 2 or whatever, you could write it as body, you know, force 1, 2. Um, one thing that's important to notice about this naming convention uh, only use this naming convention on vector variables. Okay, so for example, uh, what if you had a box sitting on the ground and your free body diagram had a weight force and a normal force and you called that normal force the force on the body. Well, let's call this A 
the force on A by the floor. No! And I'll show you why this could lead to big problems if you do it uh, in the next thing. But does everyone follow what I'm saying there? So if it's a force vector variable, you can use that double subscript notation, and it's going to make a lot of things a lot easier to keep track of for us. If you have a force that's represented by a scalar variable, don't use that. Just use a single, just call it N or R or whatever, okay? Okay, so Newton's third law. I'm going to always abbreviate that N3L because I love abbreviations. Um, and this is why that uh, double subscript notation is so nice as a bookkeeping tool. If you're using that double subscript notation, this is... This is the beginning and end of Newton's third law. All you need to know is the force on A by B is equal to negative force on B by A. So that's the case for uh, force vectors. Yes. For um, uh, this is this is totally general. In every case, this is true. So I'll do a bunch of examples that'll show um, how it works. But um, okay. So what do you do if? if you have a force variable that's not a vector. Um, so if a force variable is a scalar instead of a vector, when you switch bodies, First, keep the same variable. Don't make the variable negative. And draw the arrow in the opposite direction. Okay, so let me do an example that incorporates all this stuff. Um, so let's say we have an incline. that makes an angle of 20 degrees with the horizontal. And we have a box sitting on the incline with a mass of five kilograms. And then we have a pulley and a cable over the pulley connects the five kilogram box to a two kilogram box that's hanging. Um, and 
and we want to know what's the force vector applied to the five kilogram box by the incline. Okay, well, I'm going to first isolate the hanging mass. Weight is 2 times 9.81, so 19.62. And the cable force is T. And so that's all the force is acting on that. So now we can go to Newton's second law. Um, coordinate system is the standard one, with x to the right and y up. Uh, what's the force vector representation of the weight there? Um, well, let's just do it vector by vector. So what's the, so the 19.62 is in the negative y direction, so that's going to be 0, whoops, 0, negative 19.62. The cable force is 0t. And all that is equal to 0 because it's at rest. I didn't say that, but this is statics. Actually, it doesn't have to be at rest. It could be at rest or one other state. What's the other possibility? Yep, if it's moving with a constant velocity, everything's the same. Although in that case, actually, we could use the coefficient of friction. We don't have to. Uh, OK, so the first equation is 0 equals 0. And that's reassuring. It makes us feel like we really know what 0 is about. But it doesn't help us solve this problem. So go to the second equation, and you get the t. Well, let me write out the equation. Uh, negative 19.62 plus t is equal to 0. So t is equal to 19.62. And I try to bring these things up as they come up in statics. I mentioned that um, I mentioned before that uh, statics can give you sort of bad habits about choosing your about point for when you go to dynamics. Because in dynamics, your about points are limited to the center of mass and fixed points. Remember that? Uh, the other, another bad habit you can get is you look at this and you think, what's the, what's the tension in that cable, you know? And you think, well, there's just a two kilogram mass hanging from it. So the tension in that cable must be the weight of that thing, 19.62. And we do this once, and you see that that's true. And in fact, all the way through statics, you could take that shortcut, and it would, and it would give you the right answer. But when you get to dynamics, if this was a system where that was accelerating, if you make that assumption, the, the, um, the tension in that cable will not be 19.62 if the thing's accelerating. So I would recommend, I don't know what I would do about taking off points or whatever, but take the time to just isolate the body, calculate what that tension is, and go from there. Because that's an approach that's going to work generally when you go to dynamics. Too. Okay. Who's with me on that? Two people? OK, four people, five, good. Five's enough. The rest of you can do what you want. OK. Um, So now the free body diagram of the five kilogram. Yep, 
If they ask, tell them that thing about uh, tell them that thing about the cable tension. Okay, they might not know that. Okay, so now we're doing the one on the incline. Uh, there's a weight force of 49.05. And there's the cable force this way. Do we know what that is? That's T, so I'll just write that now as 19.62. We already calculated that. And then there's a friction contact. Um, between the box and the incline. So I'm going to represent that as a force vector. And I'll call that the force um, on the five kilogram box by the incline. And so now we'll go to Newton's second law. Uh, we have the weight force of 0, negative 49.05. We have the contact force of F, I, I. I'll break it up into X and Y components. <clears throat> And then we have this 19.62 that's at a funny angle. So let's think about what that is. So there's our coordinate system. We know that this makes an angle of um, 20 degrees with the negative x-axis. Does everyone see that, that angle? OK, so and now. To use cosine and sine, we're going to go counterclockwise from the x-axis to this. It's 20 degrees short of 180, or you can think of plus 180 minus 20. So that angle's 160. And so that unit vector is um, cosine and sine of 160. And that is negative 0 0.940, uh, positive 0.342. And so that force vector is 19.62 times this unit vector. Can someone calculate that? I don't have that in front of me. <coughs> Negative 18.44. Negative 18.44. 0.71. Okay, thanks. And those are equal to zero. So the x equation says um, F5IX is equal to 18.44. And the y equation says F5iy is equal to 49.05 minus 6.71 uh, what's that? Forty-two point six six. That makes sense. Okay, so what that tells us is that the force vector on the five kilogram block by the incline is equal to eighteen point four four 
42.66, and we're using newtons. Any questions about that? Um, that force vector has a magnitude of 19.62 in this unit vector direction, so it's multiplied by magnitude times. Any other questions? Yes. Would you stop there? Like, does that answer the question? Yeah, it just asked for, I think I asked for uh, what's the force vector on the five by the incline. So, yep, that's the answer. Nope. Uh, the components of the vector is fine. Any other questions? Okay, let's do a harder one. Um, so let's say We have an incline with a pulley at the corner. And on the incline, there's a cart with a box sitting on top of it. And there's a hanging mass of, uh, let's say that's one kilogram. And let's say this angle with the horizontal is 10 degrees. This isn't harder, is it? Well, let's just do it. Uh, there's nothing that's harder about this problem. <laughs> you can just treat those two things like they're a single object. Um, what? Okay, yeah, yeah, in pen. Okay. Yeah, let me know if you write anything in pen, and then we'll just make it work. All right, well, let's calculate the force vector. Uh, We want to calculate the force on the two by the one. Okay. What? Oh, um, the So, and that's the box on top. <laughs> we can skip like everything about this problem. And so let's just do this. Uh, so free body diagram of the one kilogram. This would be like a mean problem to give on a test because you could spend a lot of time on this problem, but you can do it in one easy step, actually. So um, the weight acting down is 1 times 9.81, so 9.81 newtons. And the only contact between the boundary and the surroundings are the friction contact there. And so that's the force on the 1 by the 2.
And so Newton's second law says F12x, F12y plus 0, negative 9.81. Is equal to zeros. And so F12 as a vector is equal to zero positive 9.81. And so if F12 is equal to zero positive 9.81 newtons. Newton third's, Newton's third law says F21 is equal to 0, negative 9.81. Woo! That was hard. Equal to the opposite of the weight, or the weight of the top thing. Yes, question? Nope. Okay. Um, Want to know a cool way to re-express things in new coordinate systems that you probably didn't use in physics, but uh, we'll, if you take deform with me, we'll use it all the time. It's a really useful thing in all kinds of mechanics. Um, So how do you re-express a vector in a new coordinate system? Um, and uh, the one I'm going to give you here is for 2D. There's a 3D version of this, too. Um, but if you have a vector, I'll call it V old, expressed in the old coordinate system. And you want that same vector, I'll call it V new, expressed in the new coordinate system. Um, so let's say this is the old coordinate system. And you want to re-express it in a coordinate system like this. Then find the counterclockwise angle theta. That rotates the old coordinate system to the new coordinate system. Then make this matrix cosine of theta, sine of theta, uh, negative sine of theta, cosine of theta. Then V in the new coordinate system is just equal to that matrix Q times V in the old coordinate system. And multiplying vectors by matrices is a pain if you do it by hand, but your calculator does it in a tiny fraction of a second. So uh, with your calculator, it's 
pretty quick. Uh, let me show an example of how this works. You know, um, remember in physics one when you did these incline problems? Let's say we want to find the weight force vector in a coordinate system that is rotated. So I'll say in the coordinate system aligned with the incline. Uh, and let's say this angle is 30 degrees. Well, in the standard coordinate system, like this, um, the weight force vector mg is 0, negative 19.62. That's easy to calculate. And if you're going from the coordinate system, this coordinate system, to this coordinate system, what angle counterclockwise do you have to rotate this? Point, yep, 70, whatever. Remember I said 90 degrees? Yeah, whatever. Uh, so theta is equal to 30 degrees. So the rotation matrix is cosine 30, sine 30, negative sine 30, cosine 30, which is 0 0.866.5, negative 0 0.5, 0 0.866. And so mg in the new coordinate system is this matrix. Times our original vector of 0, negative 19.62. Uh, negative 9.81, and then can someone tell me what 0 0.866 times 19.62 is? Newtons. Since I wrote out all the steps, it looked like that took a long time, but if you have a program in your calculator or something where, so like in my calculator, I just type in rotation matrix or go to this program, type in 30 degrees, done. And you never have to think about rotating coordinate systems again, which is the goal. As little thinking as possible. You know, every time you make a mistake, it's because of thinking. Have you guys done matrix multiplication before? How many people here have done it before? Not all, but most. Um, let me uh, let me just write out a formula. Uh, 
Um, so if you have the matrix uh, A, B, C, D, and you're multiplying it by the vector E, F, the answer is a vector, and the X component is A, E plus B, F, and the Y component is C, E plus B, F. But all of the TI calculators will do that calculation for you. Okay, so now we're done. Yes. No, not in this class. But uh, every matrix multiplication. Uh, follows this formula. Um, so the matrix element IK is equal to the sum of AIJ times B, J, K for J from one to however many matrix elements you have. So where the first element is the row and the second element is the column. So that's matrix multiplication for any size matrix. Um, and that's basically what you would write to make a little computer program that does your matrix multiplication for you. All right, so now we're done with particle statics. And we're going on to rigid body statics. Um, so now objects can have length dimensions. So objects do have length dimensions. And therefore, um, forces act at different locations on the body. And therefore, um, forces have the tendency to change an object orientation. When all the forces are acting at the same point, well, for one thing, if if every part of a body is at the same point, there's no such thing as orientation. And then if, if all the forces act at the same place, then they're not going to cause a rotation. But if the forces, you know, like if a football player is running and one person gets him in the lower leg and one person hits him the other way uh, at the top, he's going to flip, you know. And that's, that's the new effect that we have with rigid body statics that we didn't have uh, with particle statics. Um, so here's sort of a representation. Uh, think of a car 
on ice uh, with a force applied. So this is supposed to be a top view of a car. Okay, so there's two different cases. Uh, if you apply a big force to one car here, say 50,000 newtons, and you apply a big force to the other car here, um, well, the, if you track the acceleration of the center of mass, those two cars' accelerations would be the same. If these were particles, and all you care about is how the center of mass moves, those are identical. But if you're tracking the orientation of the car, this would make it just slide straight like that, and this one would make it spin. Okay, so that's that's what's new with rigid bodies. Um, so the key concept that's new. is the moment of a force about a point. Um, and so as an illustration, let's say this is the body that we're looking at, just some random object. Um, and the moment of the force, let's call this force vector F, and let's say that the point that we're doing the calculation about is A. Um, so let's say that the point we're doing the calculation around is there. And the force is applied here. Then if you draw um, a vector from A, the about point, to where the force is applied, and call that vector the Greek letter rho, then the moment that that force produces about A is equal to the vector rho crossed with the vector F. Uh, the idea of a moment. By the way, moment uh, in physics, uh, in your physics class, they might have called it torque a lot of times. In physics, they tend to use those two interchangeably. And they are, I mean, technically, they are interchangeable. But in engineering, I'm going to always call that a moment because a torque is a specific kind of motion on an object. Uh, so when I say moment, it's exactly what people mean when they say torque. Um, the intuitive idea of the moment. So intuitively, uh, if you think of think of a bolt that isn't turning very easily, you're trying to turn it with a wrench. And you're capable of applying 500 newtons of force to the wrench. That's probably, probably too much. Let's say 200. Uh, 
you're trying to loosen it. So righty tighty lefty loosey. So we want to go this way. So let's say if you apply 200 newtons there versus 200 newtons there versus 200 newtons there. Um, you know from experience that uh, if you're going to apply the same force to this wrench, the easiest way to turn it is to get your hand as far away from, from the thing that you're trying to turn as possible. That's why uh, when you're doing um, when you're doing plumbing stuff where uh, where you're trying to turn things that are really hard to turn, you use gigantic wrenches, and you know for other easier jobs you can use those little tiny ones. So if you apply that uh, 200 newtons here, that's the most likely you are to be able to get that bolt loose. If you apply it here. You're half as likely, you know, it's half as much uh, impetus to make this turn. And if you apply it here, it doesn't even matter if it's 200, it can be 50 billion newtons. It's never going to turn. It doesn't, it doesn't have any tendency to turn that thing. All it's going to do is just rip the head off the bolt. Okay, so that's the idea of what a moment does. And um, this cross product formula uh, deals with the fact that. It's not just the distance from what you're trying to turn that matters, or just the force. It's the component of the force that's perpendicular to this line, how far that is away. And that's what the cross product does. It makes sure you're only talking about that perpendicular component. Because like how likely, so you could also apply a 200 Newton force this way, right, straight. Um, you're applying that force still just as far away as this, but that would never make it turn either because there's no part of that horizontal force that's perpendicular to this line. Yes? There's some kind of thing. The in relationship to the wrench would be where you do it. That would be wherever you're applying the force, so like here. And then this would be a. Let me write that on there, actually. That's a really good. Um, so this would be A, and then this would be the point P. And so then that row vector would be this. Um, any questions about that? Yes? Yeah, um, so it is, so a moment is always going to, like, is, think of it as like a impetus to get something rotated, right? Um, and so that that rotation that it's trying to produce has an axis of rotation. Like in this case, if you apply that force, the axis of rotation would be this. And um, so the moment vector has a magnitude of this times this, according to the right-hand rule. So the moment vector would be straight out of the board. Um, if you're doing 2D problems, which is mostly what we're going to be doing, we'll do a few 3D things, but um, in a 2D problem, things can only rotate uh, in the plane, which means there are only two possible directions for the moment, out of the board or into the board. And those can just be, uh, you can differentiate between those two just with a sign you know, positive this way, negative this way. And so a lot of times in 2D, we'll talk about the moment as if it's a scalar value because it always has the same direction. You know? But really in 2D, what you have is all is moments are just always a non-zero Z component and zero X and Y components. 
So they are always accurate. Yeah. So in three dimensions, then there would be a fourth, or is it? The nope. Uh, they would still. It's just that it wouldn't always have the same direction. So if you uh, if you took this wrench and turned it kind of like halfway, if this thing was now is a sphere that was free to rotate, you know, and you took this wrench and pushed it down this way, uh, it would cause rotation in this plane. And according to the right hand rule, uh, it would be, which way did I do that? So it would be like this. And so the moment vector would be that direction. But it still lives in 3D. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, I'll give you some problems tonight on D2L, and Tuesday we'll get into moment calculations.